get started then. Uh, so today we are moving into chapter five and we're taking the tools we learned before, uh, namely the Reynolds transport theorem, okay? Um, and we're putting those into practice. So the Reynolds transport theorem had to do with the way that some, right, ineffable quantity B, right? We said B is some generic property of the fluid, big B, little b, uh, and so we counted up how the rate of change of big B in a system can be written in terms of the time rate of change in a control volume, and then the flow of little b being carried in and out of that control volume across control surfaces. Uh, and so this entire chapter is about using that expression, right, with different quantities plugged in for big B and little b. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the first of these, conservation of mass with finite control volumes. And what we want to do by the end of the day is apply the, the Reynolds transport theorem to come up with this, uh, this equation, we call the continuity equation. Um, we want to make a couple of definitions, mass flow rate and average velocity, that will make your lives uh, a little bit easier. And then we want to apply the continuity equation to both fixed and moving or deforming control volumes and actually see how the rubber meets the road there. So um, as I was just saying, I want you to recall this dilemma that we set up before, the what we used to uh, uh, motivate the Reynolds transport theorem. And that is that right, the fundamental laws of physics are stated for systems. Things like, right, by the fundamental laws of physics, I mean conservation of mass, conservation of linear and angular momentum, and conservation of energy. And so because these are stated for systems, right, for fixed collections of matter, uh, we have a problem because they're inherently difficult to apply when we're not able to follow systems exactly, which is often the case of fluids. All right, I gave the example of a pot of water. As soon as you boil it, some of it boils off in the water vapor, floats away. Uh, it becomes really difficult to keep track of every molecule that started out in that pot of water. So what we're going to do is use Right? The Reynolds transport theorem is a way of taking these system-based conservation equations, or Lagrangian conservation equations, and writing them in a way that we can work in an Eulerian framework. That is, we can pick a region of space that we're able to define mathematically, and we can use that region of space to apply these very same conservation laws. Okay, so uh, to restate, right, the Reynolds transport theorem is written that D dt of some big B in a system is equal to the time rate of change the integral over a control volume of rho B V plus integral over control surfaces of rho V dot N dA. Okay, so we've got our time rate of change of big B in the system, and then the net rate of uh, flow of big B out of the system. And I forgot to write the B. There we go. Rho in there. So um, today we're going to focus on, as I said, the first of these equations. And to do this, uh, all we need to do is state that big B right, is equal to mass, and then little b, right? So if big B is an extensive property, and little b is the intensive property, in other words, little b is big B per unit mass, then if big B is mass, little b simply becomes one, or unity. That was the example we gave before. But if we plug these values of big B and little b into um, the Reynolds transport theorem, okay, plug into the Reynolds transport theorem and we get a 
ADT, both mass of a system is equal to time rate of change, integral CV rho, dV plus integral over the control surface of rho, V n, dA. And this right here is the continuity equation. Derivation done. All right. Uh, this is why the Reynolds transport theorem is so great. Is because it's a stencil. Okay. It's a it's a, it's a it's a pattern, and you just for everything you want to conserve, whether it's energy, momentum, or mass, you simply cho choose the appropriate quantities for big B and little B, and plug it in and go. Uh, all right. So this this here. Um, let's go through each term and write out the interpretation. This first term is. Right, the rate of change of mass inside a control volume and the second term is the net rate of mass flowing out through the control surfaces. And I want you to remind you that, right, that on the left-hand side, right, this is the mass of a system. The system uh, happens to be the system of fluid that at this instant in time that we're writing this equation is inside of the control volume. So if this is your Right, if this is your system, we would say, here's the control volume we're draw drawing around that system. Okay. At some instant later in time, the system may flow out of the control volume. They're no longer coincident. But a new system can be defined inside of the bounds of that control volume. And this law will still hold. So um, this is a way of saying that every instant in time, there is a system of fluid inside the control volume uh, that for which this conservation law applies. So, by extension, this conservation law then applies to the control volume we've defined. Um, okay, uh, so by far the most uh, problematic term here, the most complicated part of applying this equation, comes in this term right here, where we have to calculate the net rate of outflow of mass, or efflux of mass out through the control surfaces. And that's because of that uh, integral of a dot product. Okay, So I want to take a moment to revisit this idea of influx and efflux. OK, so all right, the integrand of the second term contains this dot product right here. V dot N. <coughs> so if we consider like a control volume uh, shown here, right? The normal vectors always point out of the control volume. So we have normal vector there, normal vector there. And let's say we have flow in here and flow out here. B, B. All right. Um, remember that this V dot N term gives us the component of the velocity that occurs perpendicular to the surface. And the sign of it is going to indicate whether the flow is going in or out of the control volume. On the left-hand side, we would call this an inlet, right? Because flow is going into that box we've drawn. Um, but what is going to be the dot product of V and N? going to be negative the magnitude of V, right? They're parallel, uh, but pointing in opposite directions. So we would say that V dot N, right, is a negative quantity. On the right-hand side, it's going to be a positive quantity. But it's going to be less than the magnitude of V because 
because the two vectors are not perfectly aligned. In fact, it'll be V cosine of the angle between them because it's a dot product. All right, so um, integrating, so this is right. This is what's contained inside a in second integral in our continuity equation right here. Uh, but integrating over a section of a control surface, uh, for example, taking taking an inlet or taking an outlet uh, and integrating over only that piece of the control uh, control surface. So integral over piece of such as inlet or outlet will give integral over a v dot m dA is equal to q. This is what we call the volumetric flow rate. Integrating over that same area v dot n this time multiplied by the density. Okay, and this is what shows up in the continuity equation. This is what we would call m dot be rho times q. This is what we call the mass flow rate. And then finally, if we were to take the integral the surface of A, rho, V dot N, dA, divide this by rho A. Okay. This is going to give us 20 Q over A, which is equal to V bar, which we would call the average normal velocity. All right, a um, little more, more interpretation, right? M dot is what shows up in our uh, continuity equation. Right? This is the rate of mass flowing across control surface. Uh, but M dot can be written as rho times Q, as I said before. It can also be written as rho times that surface area of that control surface times V bar. In other words, what we're saying is if we compute the average of the mean velocity component, we take that v dot n, say that's our, our, our normal velocity, and we average it over the surface to get v bar. We multiply that by the surface itself, that will give us the volumetric flow rate, and then multiply it by density, and we'll get the mass flow rate. The reason this is important is because it's often a lot easier to get an average flow rate or an average uh, velocity than it is to do the, the full integral all by itself, because in many cases you'll be given a uh, an average um, an average velocity. All right. So pictorially, if we say, all right, um, if we have a surface right here. Let's go ahead and say this is a uh, uh, right control surface segment with area A, we'll say that the normal vector is facing this way and that we have right, um, a velocity field crossing it, like so. If we wanted to draw then um, V dot n, right? The components of the normal velocity. We might show end up with something that looks like this. Right? Where the length of each one of these is the dot product of this 
velocity vector where it crosses with the normal vector. Okay. And then if we were to draw behind this thing, if we were to go ahead and apply this uh, expression right here to come up with v bar and plot that on top, the idea is that if this is v bar, the area under this rectangular section that has a constant equivalent velocity of v bar is going to be the same as the area under this curve of v bar. Such that they represent the same volumetric flow rate across that control surface. <coughs> the other reason that we often, um, right, so I'm, I'm, I'm been concentrating on at this point, if I zoom, go up here a second, I've been concentrating on this term right here, right? And the, one of the other big reasons for that is because. Uh, a lot of the problems we're going to see in this class um, are given to you as steady. Right? They'll say this is a steady flow. And if we have a steady flow, what term gets knocked out? Anything that has a DDT on it. Okay? Anything with a time derivative goes to zero. Um, which leaves us only with surface integrals. So, oops. so let's say for steady flows, time derivative of mass of the system, T, rho, C, V, rho, V, control surface, rho, V, N, A, right? That term will get eliminated such that we end up with the mass, time rate of change of the mass of the system being accounted for only through flow in and out of the control volume. And of course, right, because conservation of mass applies to a system, this has to equal zero, right? Because the time rate of change of mass of any system has to be zero. That's the idea of conservation of mass. So that leaves us with Right, integral over the control surface of rho v dot n dA is equal to zero. And this is equivalent to saying sum of the mass flow rate out minus the sum of all mass flow rates in is equal to zero, or sum of the mass flow rates in is equal to the sum of the mass flow rates out. Okay, the reason I'm using the summation term is that um, the idea being if we have, let's say we have, uh, I'll do a little bit better of a job drawing this. Okay, let's say we have a pipe network. It has multiple points of fluid flowing in and multiple points of fluid flowing out. So let's say one, two, three, four, five. Basically, points one and three would be considered in inlets, right? Points where mass is flowing into our control volume, and points two, four, and five would be outlets. So, the continuity equation in this case would boil down to saying m dot one plus m dot three, right? That's sum of the mass flow rates in is equal to m dot 2 plus m dot 4 plus m dot 5. Okay, 
And the way we would actually compute this m dot, right, as before, say m dot in is equal to integral over some inlet area rho b dot n dA equal to rho v bar a in and m dot out equal to integral over the outlet area rho v bar n dA is equal to rho v bar a out. Okay. And um, remember here that v bar is not necessarily going to be the same in both of these expressions because it comes from the integral over the respective area. But this is where, right, when we're applying like the Bernoulli equation and you have to use conservation of mass or the continuity equation there, this is where this idea of um, right, v a, v1 a1 equals v2 a2. It's because let's say we've got a converging nozzle okay. flow in this end, flow out this end. We might say right that the inlet is 1, the outlet is 2, and then saying the sum of the mass flow rate in is equal to the sum of the mass flow rate out, the equivalent of saying rho v bar in times a in is equal to rho v bar out times a out. If we can assume that the fluid is incompressible and homogeneous, that is that rho is constant, we can cancel it out from both sides and we end up with the v in a n equals v out a out, which is the familiar term we've been using with the Bernoulli equation. All right. Um, this point, I've got That's about it for definitions and derivations. So let's work through some examples uh, with some actual numbers. All right. Um, consider a case where we've got. Let's see. A straight pipe, okay. Um, flow goes in at a uniform flow rate on the left-hand side, so uniform constant velocity across the entire uh, inlet area, and it comes out, okay, um, with a parabolic um, flow rate given by u of r equal to 1 minus r over r squared times u max. Okay, a few more definitions. Um, this is has this constant flow velocity at the inlet is capital U. <laughs> Say the radius of this thing is big R. And okay. Right, so at the inlet, our velocity distribution is simply rectangular. At the outlet, draw this one more time, velocity distribution goes from
So what we're asked to find in this particular problem is the relationship between u and u max and the relationship between the average u at the outlet and capital U. So with any mass, mass uh, conservation problem, my recommended procedure is first start out First, start out writing the, the full version of the continuity equation. <laughs> okay, so we say d cis dt is equal to d dt cv rho dv plus. assumptions we can make? Well, um, does the problem statement itself say anything about the flow being unsteady? No. So we can, if we're not told that it's unsteady, then we are justified in assuming it to be steady. Okay, so we can go ahead and cancel this out, right? Zero, because the flow is steady state. And at this point, we could expand right, this term into two parts. We could say, right, oh, this whole thing is equal to zero. So we could say that zero is equal to the integral over the inlet control surface, rho v dot n dA plus the integral over the outlet control surface, rho v dot n. A, okay, where this first term is equal to negative m dot in, and the second term is equal to m dot out. So let's calculate each one of these in turn. Right. The inlet, uh, <coughs> negative m dot in equal to rho v dot n dA. So right, looking at the velocity distribution at the inlet, okay, what is the scalar quantity of that v dot n that goes into the uh, We've got a uniform velocity, right? A big U. <coughs> so that's the magnitude of the speed. It doesn't change over the surface area. It is pointing opposite the normal vector at that point. Okay, because the normal vector is pointing out of the control surface. Oops. And so this V dot N, right, is going to be equal to negative U. And so this becomes a case where we can write that v bar right, is equal to negative u. So negative m dot in is negative rho a u, where a is simply equal to pi r squared, right, 
it says negative rho pi r squared u. All right. So that's the negative. I mean, we've included a negative on both sides here. This, so this quantity right here is the rate at which mass is flowing in through the left-hand side, the pipe where the flow is uniform. This should make some sense. Okay. Um, the more complicated term comes in from the outlet. We say that m dot out is equal to integral over the outlet control surface rho v dot n dA. Okay. So in this one, we can actually um, we should actually go through the process of integrating because v is no longer uniform over the entire area. So it's changing over the domain of integration. Uh, so we can write a that v dot n is equal to u max 1 minus r over r squared. We're able to do that, right, because <coughs> because the normal vector and the velocities all point in the same direction. So taking the dot product of them, we just get the magnitude of the speed out. <coughs> so plugging that into the integral out is out of rho times max 1 minus r over r squared dA. Okay, what does our domain of integration actually need to look like to integrate over our cylindrical area? This is going to be equal to Integral from zero to r uh, rho v max one r over r squared two pi r dr. <coughs> Next thing we want to do is inspect our integral for anything that is going to be constant from zero to r density, right? If we're assuming that this is a incompressible and homogeneous fluid where density is constant, we can move that outside of the integral, right? Because it doesn't change inside. Uh, what about u max, right? That's another constant value, in fact, that's what we're trying to find, is that the u max is going to be the value of the velocity out here at the highest point. So both of these quantities can be moved outside of the integral. Rho times v max from zero to r one r squared. This two pi can come out as well. R the r. Getting equal to pi rho u max integral from zero to r of r minus r cubed over r squared dr. <coughs> two pi rho max. squared over 2 minus <coughs> 4 4 r squared from 0 to r 2 pi rho <coughs> max <coughs> r squared 
squared over 2 minus r squared over 4. Okay, distribute that 2 in. We'll get rid of that 2. That becomes 2. We end up with this being equal to pi r squared rho u max over 2. That's our m dot house. So if it's a steady flow, okay, so the time rate of change isn't the same. Um, we can say that the mass, that the sum of the mass flow rates in is equal to the sum of the mass flow rates out. We computed both of those in this case. So we're going to apply m dot in equals m dot out, and say that. I r squared rho times the constant velocity u is equal to pi r squared rho u max over 2. So part A of this problem, right, was to find the relationship between big U, right, or capital U, and U max. Well, if we do that, just look at this, right? We can cancel out pi's, we can cancel out our squares, we can cancel out rows. And right now we have that the big U is equal to U max over 2. Okay? So there's the solution to part A. Part B was find the relationship between U max, or sorry, between um, capital U and the mean flow velocity at the outlet, okay, the average flow speed. To find the average flow speed, right, we'd say m dot out is equal to rho a out. U bar out. Okay. Set this equal to the actual value we calculated. Pi r squared rho u max over 2. Plugging in uh, a out here, right? We'd say this is pi r squared. And so we're going to get the same expression, actually. We'd say rho pi r squared u bar out is equal to pi r squared rho u max over 2. Cancel everything out. So we find that u, the bar out, is equal to u max over 2 and therefore equal to the mean flow speed, or equal to the, the inlet flow speed. Okay, so this should have a couple of checks in here that make sense to us. Um, Okay, so a couple comprehension checks, right? If we've got a cylindrical pipe and we have a constant uniform flow in from the left, okay, if the diameter or the radius of this pipe does not change, it would make sense that that uniform flow rate would be the average flow rate through any section, right? Or the, that, that uniform velocity would be the average velocity through any section, right? Because that's carrying all of the volumetric flow rate through the pipe. Um, so this fact right here, the fact that these two quantities are going to be the same, should give you, you know, warm fuzzy feeling. Um, all right, I've got only one more little note to give you, uh, and then again, I've got some more examples that I will post to Icon right after class. 
Um, just a you know a cautionary note. Remember, for deforming or moving control volumes, the time rate of change of mass of a system still has to be equal to zero, and it's still going to be time rate of change of integral of the control volume rho dv plus integral over the control surface of rho oops and remember what goes into this box here instead of being v becomes the relative velocity w where w is equal to v minus the velocity of the control surface and is defined as or what we call the relative velocity. Um, so I've got an example that will demonstrate how we, how we use the, uh, the relative velocity in one of these calculations that will be online here shortly. Um, all right. Uh, that will be it. So Wednesday, uh, come ready to do an in-class. We'll do another one of those in-class activities that's going to be worth extra credit on midterm two. Uh, dealing with mass conservation. Um,